Hi, I'm Major Vimal Raj. I'm a consultant cardiothoracic radiologist in Narayana Hridayalaya, Bangalore in south of India. It is a interest of mine to educate people on HRCT and interstitial lung disease and I'm very glad that I'm talking to you today. In this overview of HRCT in ILD, I'm going to be talking about some of the important points which will help you in improving your diagnostic skills of reading the HRCT scans. What I will be covering today is classification of interstitial lung disease with specific focus on HRCT. I will also be covering about specific tips and tricks which will help you in differentiating one ILD from the other and making your diagnosis more accurate every time you look at a HRCT scan. Then I will be covering about different methods of scoring the severity of interstitial lung disease on HRCT scans. And finally, I will be talking about the prognostic value of a HRCT scan in patients with interstitial lung disease. The current classification for interstitial lung disease comes from this statement coming out of the ATS ERS societies in 2013 where they classified interstitial lung diseases into subcategories such as chronic fibrosing interstitial pneumonias, acute or to subacute interstitial pneumonias, and then smoking-related interstitial pneumonias. So this was a broader category of classification under which we were to look at other smaller uh, diseases or specific entities into this. This got uh, updated or a little bit uh, upgraded in 2018 when we got another statement which specifically looked at the diagnosis and classification of patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This classification basically considered that if you are seeing a CT scan, every time think, can this patient have IPF or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. When you look at the common interstitial lung disease that you come across in your clinical practice, it will vary from one person to the other. It will vary from one city to the other as well as from one hospital to the other. But the most common uh, combination of ILDs that you may see are idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, IPF, you may see hypersensitivity pneumonitis, or you may see sarcoidosis. But more and more, what is being realized that there is a combining factor with all of these interstitial lung disease, and these are being clubbed together into a fibrosing interstitial lung disease or progressive fibrosing interstitial lung diseases. These are groups of interstitial lung diseases associated with fibrosis in the lungs and progression over a period of time. On an HRCT, the most common feature or a prominent feature of fibrosing interstitial lung disease is architectural distortion. This is basically seen as traction bronchiectasis and it is irreversible in nature. So when you're looking at a HRCT scan, you're looking for tractional bronchiectasis, you're looking for architectural distortion where the lung parenchyma is distorted, it's pulled apart from its normal anatomy. And you're looking for loss of volume. So when you see these parameters, you are sure that this is a fibrotic variety of interstitial lung disease. On CT, bronchiectasis is defined as dilatation of the bronchi in relation to the adjoining pulmonary arteries. So you can see here, this is a dilated bronchi, the vessel adjacent to it is much smaller compared to this bronchi. The other feature on CT is something called as non-tapering of bronchi. As we go from the center of the lung towards the periphery of the lung, you expect the bronchi to become smaller and smaller. When you lose this tapering of bronchi, that is another feature of bronchiectasis. A third feature of bronchiectasis is visibility of bronchi in the peripheral two centimeters of the lung. This part of the lung is somewhere you do not expect to see bronchi at all. 
when you start seeing bronchi in these areas then it is suspected of bronchiectasis one has to be careful of differentiating simple bronchiectasis from what is called as traction bronchiectasis in simple bronchiectasis you will see the bronchi are abnormally dilated but the adjoining lung parenchyma and interstitium is normal this is what we see as a primary airway disease but you may also see a dilatation of bronchi with adjoining interstitium being thickened or the lung parenchyma being abnormal this entity as you can see in these two cases here are suggestive of traction bronchiectasis traction bronchiectasis is a feature of fibrosing interstitial lung disease so once you've decided that the ild pattern that you're seeing is that of fibrosing interstitial lung disease then we start looking at the further subclassification of the ild it is very important for you all to be comfortable with this particular chart because this will make your life very very easy the best way of approaching this chart is starting from this fourth group which is basically saying it is a alternative diagnosis not that of a uip or an ipf diagnosis let's look at this if you have a patient who has got extensive ground glass opacities or a patient who's got cysts patient who's got mosaic attenuation dark lung and bright lung or somebody who's got extensive nodules or consolidation that means they cannot be uip they will be an alternative diagnosis where you're talking about nsip you're talking about hypersensitivity pneumonitis or cystic lung disease so every time you look at a hrct you look and decide what is the predominant pattern based on the predominant pattern then you can decide which group they will fit into in the absence of such abnormalities the second parameter you start looking is the distribution is there a subplural distribution of reticulation and traction dilatation of bronchi with honeycombing then it is uip if you are seeing subplural reticulation traction dilatation of bronchi with an apicobasal gradient but no honeycombing then it is probable uip something which is in between where you may see subtle reticulation a little bit of ground glass then it is indeterminate for uip it can get a little confusing okay but please do not worry let me just try and summarize this again look at a hrct scan if you are seeing a lot of ground glass if you're seeing a lot of nodules or if you're seeing a lot of consolidation then you know that it is not uip it is an alternative diagnosis if you are seeing subplural disease you're seeing reticulation you're seeing traction bronchiectasis with honeycombing then it is uip everything i've just said without honeycombing absence of honeycombing becomes probable uip why is this important any patient who comes to you and you suspect them to have interstitial lung disease and a ct pattern comes out as uip there is no need for you to biopsy that patient okay unless and until there is a totally differing clinical suspicion elderly patients who come up with a pattern of probable uip also perhaps do not need an invasive testing or invasive biopsy to get to a diagnosis they are also likely to have uip so a uip and a probable uip pattern gives you a very confident diagnosis of a uip or slash ipf pattern of interstitial lung disease now let's look at some cases this is a case of a typical uip where you're seeing reticular changes in the subpleural aspect of the lungs you're seeing honeycombing these layers of cysts the distribution has got an apical basal gradient and you're seeing some areas of traction dilatation of bronchi so this is what we would call as a typical uip this is another patient where you can see all the same things traction dilatation of bronchi 
subpleural disease, an apicobasal gradient, but there is no honeycombing that you can see. So this gets categorized as probable UIP. On the other hand, if you see this patient where you are seeing subpleural reticulation, some patches of ground glass are there in between. There is no honeycombing, again, some patches of ground glass. And this is what we would call it as an indeterminate for UIP. We are not sure whether it is UIP or not. We may need further investigation in this patient. The last group is an easier group to define in terms of a larger group. When you start seeing mosaic attenuation, large areas of air trapping or extensive ground glass, then you know that this is an alternative diagnosis and not that of UIP. Another example you can see here, extensive ground glass change in this patient. This again puts straight away into an alternative diagnosis. These were patients of NSIP or CTD associated ILD. This is one more patient. Again, you're seeing extensive ground glass. And if you see the subpleural aspect of the lungs are spared, bit traction bronchiectasis, fibrosing interstitial lung disease, but it is inconsistent with UIP, so it will be an alternative diagnosis. So that was all about ILD classification. Now let's look at some of the tips which will help you in determining what kind of ILD that you're dealing with. If you look at this particular case, where you're seeing a lot of ground glass opacities, you're seeing ground glass opacities and extreme lung bases are spared, there is no honeycombing in this case, you have to think in terms of an alternative diagnosis. The sparing of extreme lung bases makes it highly unlikely to be a UIP pattern. The other thing that you look for are these bronchocentric involvement. You can see that the lung parenchymal involvement is much more bronchocentric, which suggests that this is an organizing pneumonia pattern, which is often seen in patients with NSIP. So bronchocentric distribution, brown glass opacities, and extreme sparing of the lung bases is highly suggestive of NSIP pattern of interstitial lung disease. Now let's look at this another case. What you're seeing here are, again, the upper parts of the lungs are not that much involved, but the lower lobes are involved with extensive areas of honeycombing, diffused extensive areas of honeycombing. Anteriorly, what you're seeing in the anterior upper lobe, there are these focal areas of involvement, okay? This is a pattern one would think of a UIP pattern, remember? subpleural honeycombing apicobasal gradient you can see there is some traction dilatation of bronchi so this would all be a uip pattern but when you start seeing this exuberant honeycombing you're starting to see this anterior aspect of the lung being involved you have to think of a connective tissue disease pathology which is giving rise to this uip so this is very important exuberant honeycombing what is called as a straight edge sign. You can see normal and abnormal lung are clear cut, different, and this anterior upper lobe involvement, all of these features suggest that it could be a UIP secondary to connective tissue disease. Another case where you can see similar things, exuberant honeycombing in the lungs bilaterally, and again, a straight edge sign, very normal looking lungs in the top, and then you seeing this abnormal honeycombing in here, and then patchy areas of anterior upper lobe involvement. One extra thing in this case that you should be able to recognize is this area of dilated esophagus. Again, all put together, this is a CTD associated UIP pattern of ILD. So exuberant honeycombing, straight edge sign, anterior upper lobe involvement, and also dilatation of esophagus, think of CTD associated ILD. This is one of the cases which we see commonly where you're seeing diffuse areas of ground glass. And then when you start doing some expiratory scans, you start seeing areas of air trapping. So you're seeing areas of lung being normal, areas of lung being bright, 
and then areas of lung being dark. This is nowadays called as a triple density sign and this is something very very well seen in hypersensitivity pneumonitis rather than calling them chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis we call them as fibrosing hypersensitivity pneumonitis of today's days so you're looking for air trapping you may get uh, involvement of both upper zones and mid zones in these people but look for subacute changes in the background of chronic disease this is another case where you are looking at uh, very high lar involvement of the lungs and you start seeing lymph nodes and some nodularity along the lymphatic region this is classical of sarcoid so perihilar involvement calcified lymph nodes think about sarcoid lung disease so you look at this case what do you see you're seeing some ground glass changes you're seeing some traction dilatation of bronchi some patchy areas of subpleural cystic change across here and you know this is a lot of ground glass so it becomes an alternative diagnosis not that of uip but do you have anything else that will help you in picking up a diagnosis here further look at the esophagus so you see the esophagus here this is again a connective tissue disease associated with ild systemic sclerosis so never forget to look at the esophagus you can see it's distended all along in keeping with underlying scleroderma this is a patient who presented with increasing cough and what you can see are these reticular changes all the way towards the periphery extensive involvement and then there is traction dilatation of bronchi so there is subpleural involvement but not that much you look at these images the esophagus doesn't look that bad but just on one image the esophagus looks a little dilated not very convincing not very sure but there is no honeycombing apart from tiny areas so this is not uip this is not probable uip either because there is a lot of crown glass that you're looking at so this goes into the alternative diagnosis it is useful to look at the size of the pulmonary artery in some of these patients a pulmonary artery which is more than three centimeters is suggestive of pulmonary hypertension and of course you can have pulmonary hypertension secondary to pulmonary fibrosis but this was a case of again connective tissue disease with pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary parenchymal disease one common disease pattern which uh, we are seeing more and more today uh, compared to what we used to see in past is this uh, you're seeing subpleural disease you're seeing a lot of cysts or honeycombing across here and upper lobes you're seeing these large bullous areas in the paraseptal region so this is a patient who has got combined pulmonary fibrosis with emphysema the ild pattern often is uip but we've started to see other ild patterns also in these patients so this is cpfe in a patient who's got emphysema and ild sometimes you think it is easy but many a times it is not that easy now look at this case now when you look at this case you see some subpleural interstitial changes this is prone imaging and at this point in time i would have called this indeterminate uh, for uip it is indeterminate i'm not sure and then you follow it up you can clearly see that this has developed into cystic spaces or honeycombing in a three year gap now let's see another case you see this case on today's date i would call this very very typical of alternative diagnosis this is not uip i am convinced that this is an nsip pattern of interstitial lung disease lots of ground glass traction dilatation of bronchi eight years down the line I'm seeing this so this is now a UIP pattern of interstitial lung disease with extensive honeycombing so time is often the right uh, judge which will tell you what is the pattern of interstitial lung disease so today what you're seeing as a uh, NSIP pattern is more than likely to turn up as a UIP pattern in future so regular serial follow-ups are often helpful in differentiating these ILD patterns.
So now let's look at my third objective. The third objective being looking at the different scoring systems for interstitial lung disease. There are different ways of scoring ILD. You can score them visually by looking at the scan or taking the help of artificial intelligence or computer systems. Now with visual assessment, uh, every scoring is actually based on IPF. This is where it got started and people have adopted this scoring system for other areas. There are numerous scoring systems with no agreed convention. By that, I mean if I use one particular scoring system, I do not know if it is valid for my population data set or not. And therefore, different publications, different research work have looked at different scoring systems with varying results. When you look at the visual scoring systems, you can look at three things. One of the simplest one is called as a comparative scoring, whereby the degree of honeycombing is compared with the degree of reticulation or degree of ground glass is compared with degree of reticulation. The other method is a semi-quantitative method, whereby you're looking at the severity of disease in terms of is it just simple reticulation or has it gone into honeycombing but also the extent of disease so you're looking at how much of the lung is involved the last one is a quantitative assessment which is basically assessing the percentage of lung that is involved in total with the different patterns of involvement when it comes to the visual scoring systems uh, the lungs get divided into various slices or various sections depending on which system you follow then we have to recognize the specific pattern of ILD that we are seeing and then the percentage of pattern involvement in the lung is calculated. This can get very confusing so I have done this. I am showing you one very easy pattern whereby you take six slices. You are not worried about the other images. You are just taking six slices of the lung. A slice which is just above the carina that is at the level of the aortic arch, the slice which is one centimeter above the hemidiaphragm, and a slice which is in the right pulmonary venous confluence where the right pulmonary vein drains into the left atrium. A slice one centimeter below the carina, and a slice which is halfway between these two slices, and a slice which is two centimeter below the right hemidiaphragm. So basically, these are predetermined slices. Aortic arch, carina, right hemidiaphragm, above it, below it, and at the point of the right inferior pulmonary venous confluence. Once you have seen in this, what you are doing is looking for honeycombing, looking for reticulation, looking for traction bronchiectasis. Then you say, let's say in one particular image, you're seeing honeycombing, let's say one centimeter below carina, you have to say I'm seeing honeycombing and I'm seeing it in 10% of the image or 20% of the image. So that becomes the honeycombing score for that image. Same image may also have ground glass, may also have reticulation. So you score each individual image, each individual abnormality and you come up with what is called as a total fibrosis score. Some other people have actually divided the lungs rather than the six images, they divide the lungs into six segments, the upper third, the middle third and the lower third and do the exact same exercise. A little confusing, uh, needs much more time to be spent on this, but it is easier to do if you have few cases in your practice. So, look at some of the examples for example this is one patient who's got a total fibrosis score of 170 so if i were to score this in this particular image i would say for example here there is this ground glass attenuation so i would say ground glass is less than five percent or which is five percent of the lung in this image is ground glass i do not see much of uh, honeycombing in here but some reticulation in this image I would say reticulation getting 10%. Similarly, as I go in different patients, you can see here honeycombing is occupying 10% of the lung. 
So everything put together, you come up with a total fibrosis score. Or you can see here, the scoring increases as the degree of fibrosis increases in a patient. The use of this fibrosis score is that it is very clearly demonstrated is people who have a higher fibrosis score, depending on which method you use, there is a cutoff. But anybody with a high fibrosis score has a poor outcome, the survival outcome, the DLCO outcome, everything matches very well with a fibrosis score. The problem comes in the inter and intra observer variability when it comes to this visual assessment of scores. So if you look at this paper where multiple people's study has been compared, you can see the inter observer variability is great in some of the study when you're looking at the consensus of fibrosis, but it can be as bad as 0.2% or one in five concurrence when you're looking even amongst chest radiologists. So the variation between an observer's findings in the visual assessment is alarming and worrisome. Therefore, these systems have really not taken off in real life clinical practice. This has led to a lot of research in the field of computer learning or machine-based learning. And you can see these are all the different methods of actually looking at the fibrosis on HRCT and quantifying it. So if you see this, this is a compendium of different methods that one can use to look at the fibrosis in different techniques. So amongst all of these, what is most important and very well justified is something called as Caliper. Caliper is again a software which automatically looks into the HRCT scans and comes up with this data. It is able to differentiate areas of normal lung from those of ground glass, reticulation and honeycombing and able to give us a score. This is fantastic and it is very, very reliable and reproducible. The most exciting thing in Caliper is something called as PVRS. This is pulmonary vessel related substance. So this is a purely machine generated parameter which looks at the amount of interstitial tissue or the amount of pulmonary vessel related substances in a scan. This is being shown to be highly effective in monitoring of ILD and also in prognosis. I will also like to talk about a indigenously built software system, which is now slowly becoming available to all pulmonologists. I do have a conflict of interest in the fact that Predible is something I have contributed to and I'm one of the advisors for Predible. Predible is again a machine learning based software whereby you load a CD onto the internet and it'll come out with results automated. First, it looks at lung cancer screening, sees if there is any nodules or mass lesions. Then it quantifies emphysema to a very highly accurate levels. Then it is able to classify ILD again and give us a quantification in terms of the degree of honeycombing, the amount of uh, involvement of each lung, and also any degree of uh, ground glass which is suggestive of a reversible disease. So Predible is something which is coming up and if you are interested, uh, please do visit their website and they will be able to help you. With the HRCT quantification, it is becoming a norm as we go forward because it is reproducible, especially if you're using machine detected uh, quantification. It is actually mimicking very well to the PFT parameters that one comes across. And it may become the new normal where with the pandemic where PFT performance can be a little tricky in some of the institutes and HRCT might be much more easier to uh, get the scans done and easier for follow up. So that brings us to the last objective of my talk today about role of prognosis of HRCT in interstitial lung disease. Well, the first and foremost thing that we all are very well aware of and comfortable with the fact that any patient who has honeycombing 
it is a poor predictor. So a HRCT scan which shows honeycombing, irrespective of the pattern of ILD, it is a poor prognostic feature. Also, there is very good evidence with caliper, especially that HRCT can differentiate people who will slowly progress into further disease or people who will die soon. And there are two parameters which have proven to be of use. Patients who have a fibrotic percentage of more than 20%, especially in IPF, are poor prognostic uh, in terms of progression of disease and in terms of mortality. So you do not want to have patients who have higher uh, fibrosis score of more than 20%. The PVRS that we were talking about is also a very good prognostic feature and anybody who has a PVRS score of more than 5% is also likely to do poorly with the disease. PVRS is also very useful in research purposes whereby if you have a cutoff value of say anybody who has a PVRS of more than 4.4% we will not be taking them up for drug trials because they are likely to respond poorly then you can cut down the sample size required for any drug trial by about 26%. So this is becoming a biomarker in assessing these patients along with therapy but also for research. It is also useful to differentiate the IPF from NSIP pattern based on the caliber software whereby you're looking at more and more reticular patients tend to be of NSIP pattern of ILD rather than the IPF or UIP pattern of ILD. Also remember reticular pattern of disease has got poor prognosis in chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. This is something very well documented and very well researched in patients who have extensive reticulation as part of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, they do poorly. Similar results are available with the systemic sclerosis also where honeycombing is a poor prognostic feature. People who have UIP pattern is a poor prognostic feature also. Finally, this was one of the conclusions which were drawn in a direct head-to-head -head comparison between visual analysis and caliper analysis and what was clearly seen that the PVRS is a great tool and likely to change the way we practice pulmonary medicine in future and caliper or any other machine-based learning systems were much superior to the visual assessment that we can do on today's day. So in summary, first and foremost, it is important to classify every interstitial lung disease into fibrosing and non-fibrosing variety. This can be done based on looking for architectural distortion, traction bronchiectasis, looking for loss of volume, and looking for progression in the CT scans. Once you've seen a CT every time, try and classify them into UIP, probable UIP, or an alternative diagnosis. And if you're not sure, then indeterminate for UIP. The visual assessment of fibrosis score is something possible, and there are multiple ways of doing it, but they are not very reliable, and they are not reproducible. The future is with machine learning based uh, algorithms which will help us to quantify the degree of fibrosis and also look at other parameters such as PVRS which will make things much more easier in checking patients and seeing if they are progressing well or if they are responding poorly to the drug therapy. With this I would like to thank you for your kind attention and also introduce you to the ACE Radiology Masterclass which I have been conducting specifically for people interested in chest and cardiac imaging. For more details, please do email me in the address given here or look up at my YouTube channel. Thank you very much.